Hi, my name is Gina Catania and I'm a certified health coach. I have been a health enthusiast since I was a little girl and took charge of our huge organic garden. And for the last 24 years I've been working with people to create their most exquisite, energetic and inspired lives through healthy living. So, imagine my complete shock and disbelief when in 2008 a cancerous lump was discovered in my breast. I was really stunned. But as I've done with every other health-related issue that crossed my path, I researched every possible aspect of breast cancer, its causes, methods of diagnosis, treatment, prevention, and I encountered many theories and many paths of healing. I'm committed to presenting the remedies and paths I know to be true. So during my research, when I was fortunate enough to discover Dr. Goodson, I was so moved and impressed by his caring and concern and commitment to the truth about breast cancer that I'm really happy that he's here with us today. Dr. William H. Goodson III has 30 years of experience in the diagnosis and care of breast diseases. He is a leader in breast care in San Francisco and he was the only Northern California surgeon to participate in the original clinical trials that demonstrated that breast conservation or lumpectomy is a safe and effective treatment for early breast cancer. His commitment to the best care possible means that he conducted and published peer-reviewed research on most aspects of breast diseases, including the undeniable role of environmental toxins that are directly related to the severity and frequency of diseases we are experiencing today. Because of his amazing commitment to healing, I am very proud to present Dr. Goodson and his work to you today. Dr. Goodson. Thank you, Gina. I do appreciate the invitation and I do appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening. I'm going to talk about breast cancer, prevention, treatment, and the environment. And most of what I'm going to talk about in prevention and treatment are the things that you can do for yourself. And then I'm going to talk about the environment a bit because that's something that's very hard to do very much about as an individual. It's something that we have to address as a society. I've been doing breast cancer treatment for a long time. And if you look at the changes in the treatment of breast cancer over the last 40 years, it's amazing. We've learned about how to do an effective anti-estrogen treatment starting with tamoxifen, moving on to aromatase inhibitors. We've learned to do breast conservation. We've learned to use needle biopsies for almost all the biopsies we do, which really spares a lot of women uh, having surgical biopsies. Chemotherapy's been around, but the thing that we've really learned to do is to control the side effects of chemotherapy so that a person can have chemotherapy and expect to have a reasonably normal life during the, the process. We've learned how sentinel node biopsies are both reliable and useful, but they also then spare many women from having very many nodes removed at all, which has obvious long-term implications. And one of the things that I've been very involved in in the last 10 years is what's called oncoplastic surgery. And that means being able to take a cancer out of the breast, put the breast back together and make it so that yes, you have a scar, but the shape and the, and the appearance of the breast actually should pretty much end up being about like it was when it was made in the first place. The thing that hasn't happened very much is a lot of stuff that has to do with prevention. Now, I don't mean giving somebody a pill, tamoxifen, raloxifen, an aromatase inhibitor, because these things will reduce the risk of breast cancer, but we give them to people who are at high risk. There's only really a small number of people who are identified at being at high risk, and the majority of breast cancer occurs in women who are not, quote, high risk. And what we need to think about is how to actually address the issue of breast cancer and the things that are influencing breast cancer in our society. The first thing I'm going to talk about is what I think of as the usual suspects, the things that are pretty much under the control of any woman if she chooses to make that kind of decision. And the first thing in this is alcohol. Now, I know we are in Marin County. Napa is just north of us. Everybody loves their wine. But every, if you, and, and you can also find almost any study you want that shows anything. But if you look at large numbers of studies, you always come away with the fact that alcohol is associated with more breast cancer. Now, I've been saying this to patients for years. 
and it was December of 2011, the Wall Street Journal had an article and my patients started coming in and saying, oh, I've seen an article about this. And I said, yeah, duh. But what, what you can do, if you want to do this yourself, you can go to PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, National Library of Medicine. It's free to anybody, your tax dollars at work. And you can put in the search terms alcohol, breast cancer, and Europe, because everybody talks about the Europeans and their wine. And you can pull up a whole series of studies and start looking at them. Almost all of these studies show an association between alcohol consumption, more alcohol, more breast cancer. The study that I always focus on is the study from Spain where they looked at breast cancer in women under the age of 40 and found there was a direct correlation with the amount of alcohol that they had, usually red wine. So there are reasons, and I'll come back to these a little later, that some alcohol may be okay, but we should all be aware of how much alcohol we drink and recognize that very much alcohol is clearly associated with the risk of breast cancer. Now, as I will show you in this slide, you can draw pretty much draw a curve that relates the amount of alcohol in grams per day, that's the 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 along the bottom, to the relative risk of breast cancer. Now, relative risk means that if the risk of getting breast cancer is 12% in the general population, if you have this risk factor, you take that relative risk and multiply it by the 12%. So, for example, if somebody has a relative risk of 1.5 and you multiply it by 12%, that's 18%. So 6% of her chance of getting breast cancer is because of drinking the alcohol. Now, for the general population, that's not a huge difference. But if somebody has a high-risk family history, if they've had other problems, if they, if, for example, they had scoliosis and had a lot of radiation as a child, when a person's at higher risk, then you take that risk and multiply that by the same 1.5, you start to get very significant changes. Uh, just to put this in perspective, uh, the place where it becomes clearly significant is at about 10 to 11 grams of alcohol a, a day. Um, a three and a half ounce glass of wine, which is 13%, which is most of what you see, 13, 14% is what you're seeing in California wines these days, is actually about 12 to 13 grams of alcohol. So you're actually are getting a hair over what's a basic one drink a day as most of these calculations were done at a time when alcohol, when me, and there was less alcohol in wine. The next thing to consider is the relationship of alcohol consumption to survival from breast cancer. Kaiser Oakland uh, did a study that was published uh, several years ago in which they looked at 1,800 women, about half of whom drank alcohol and about half of whom did not. And they looked at different levels of alcohol consumption and how that influenced the risk of recurrence of the cancer and the risk of death from the cancer. And they found that six grams of alcohol a day was enough to lead to an approximately 35% increase in the chance of cancer coming back and about a 50% increase in the chance that the woman would eventually die of the cancer. Now to put that in perspective, remember I was saying that one glass of wine is about 12, so that's about a half a glass of wine a day, three and a half glasses of wine a week. That also translates almost approximately exactly to three and a half beers a week or three and a half hard liquor drinks. The amount of alcohol in a 12 ounce beer, 12 ounce, not 16, amount of alcohol in a 12 ounce beer, one and a half ounces of hard liquor, which is basically a shot glass or a glass of wine are all about the same. The other thing that's interested in there, interesting in here though, is there may be possibly in their study a slight decrease in the risk of dying of other things, specifically heart and vascular disease. And that's the thing that's always a trade-off in this. Um, if breast cancer were the only disease in the world, I would be on a rampage to tell people no alcohol at all. Uh, there is reasonably good evidence that alcohol is associated with a slight decrease in the risk of heart disease. You don't need much alcohol to get that. So what I always try to do is suggest to people to have a few drinks a week. Nobody should drink every day, and certainly nobody should get plastered more than every New Year's Eve or something like that. Now, the next question is how much a person exercises. Uh, I'm going to show you several studies. This is the California Teachers Study where they looked at 133,000 women and they looked at the patients who had 3,500 cancers. 
and they looked at activity at less than a half an hour a week, three, uh, half to three hours a week, and more than three hours of exercise a week. And what they found is the risk of cancer death, and the reason it's got a string of references here is this is published in a series of papers, but the risk of cancer death went down by almost half just doing some kind of exercise. And for the people who were doing a lot of exercise, which means more than three, three and a half hours a week, they actually had a, more than a 50%, close to a 60% reduction in the risk of dying of cancer. So you do better from cancer if you have uh, gotten exercise. And the next study is that they're actually from the Women's Health Initiative looking at 74,000 women uh, with just less than five years follow-up. They looked at the number of met hours per week. Now, I'll come back to this. Basically, it's metabolic equivalence. One met hour, as they've calculated, it means you're walking briskly for an hour. So if you take as one the risk, take that as the relative risk for somebody who does no exercise, doing some exercise but less than uh, an hour a week will, re excuse me, less than five hours a week will reduce the risk of dying of cancer by, or developing cancer by about 10%. If you exercise more than uh, five hours a week, you actually cut your risk of getting breast cancer by somewhere around 10 to 20%. Again, it's something that's in a person's control. You, this doesn't mean you have to run track or, or you know, go crazy. And in fact, if you're not already doing that, it's probably not wise to start running uh, unless you're younger. If you're my age, you definitely want to, don't want to start running. But any person can pick up some kind of activity, an elliptical, an exercise bicycle, something that the criteria is you have to be doing it at a speed that you might be able to talk, but you couldn't possibly sing. So if you think about it, if, if I'm walking along and, and, and cannot, cannot talk, I mean, can talk, but I, I just couldn't sort of play, you know, the hills are alive with the sound of music or something, then I know I'm getting enough exercise. And if you're doing it at that level, three and a half hours a week really does have a beneficial effect on people. Now, this is the nurse's health study, and it's looking at uh, 2,900 of the women who actually develop breast cancer, and they're looking at the number of hours a week that they exercised. If a person, and the top line here is the risk of recurrence. So you don't want to be on the top line, you want to be on the lower line. The top line is the risk of recurrence in people who got less than three hours a week of exercise. The middle line is the people that got somewhere between three and eight hours a week. And the bottom line is the people who got nine hours a week or more of exercise. And the message here is quite clear. You can look at the amount of exercise that a person gets and it actually influences how they survive from cancer. Um, the important point about this is that it actually was looked at in terms of whether or not you were exercising before or whether you started. You get less cancer if you are exercising, but if you are not exercising and get cancer, you're still ahead of the game if you exercise. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on diet, low-fat diets. If you follow this stuff, um, the Women's Health Initiative did a rather extensive study looking at trying to put women on a low-fat diet. They found a trend toward a decrease in the risk of uh, uh, death from breast cancer and also a decrease in the uh, incidence of breast cancer, but it didn't quite reach statistical significance, probably because a lot of the people who were in the control group decided to sort of kind of go on a lower fat diet anyway, so it wasn't a really clean study. But following up on this idea is this study uh, that was done also uh, with a large number of cancer patients, 1,800 women that were recruited from Northern California Kaiser and the Utah Cancer Registry with a median of 11 years of follow-up. So these people have been followed for a while. They looked at the dairy consumption. And I'll tell you right away, the consumption of dairy across the board didn't seem to make much difference in terms of what happened to people. The consumption of low-fat dairy did not seem to make much difference, except taking low-fat dairy may, in fact, have been associated with a slightly lower risk of heart disease. But what was interesting is they looked at high-fat dairy consumption, figuring out in basically equivalence to whole milk. So the amount of butter that would equal a glass of whole milk, ice cream that would equal a glass of whole milk, and things like that. And they looked at it in terms of people who had less than half a serving a day, 
between a half and one serving a day and one or more, excuse me, uh, more than one serving a day, basically one and a half and up. And they looked at high consumption um, risk of dying and the risk of dying from breast cancer in the women who were taking a lot of the high fat dairy was a relative risk of 1.49, which means basically that their risk of dying was essentially half again. So that if you have somebody with early breast cancer who has maybe a 10% chance in the long run of dying of the cancer, you've taken that to 15%. And you've got to decide whether the butter and the ice cream are actually worth that 5% of chance of survival. If somebody has a high risk cancer where they have a 40% chance of something coming back, you definitely want to address that because you can reduce the risk of dying. Now people look at this and they say, what the heck is that all about? And this brings me to some studies that we did a couple years ago. And the trick is, or the reason is that dairy products have hormones in them. Now this is not the, R, the recombinant bovine growth hormone. This is not something you avoid with organic milk. This is something that's in the milk, normal milk, Safeway milk, organic milk, whatever you want. It's in the milk because the cows in almost every setting in this country are pregnant. And if you think about it, a pregnant cow's got lots of hormones running around and those hormones end up in the milk. It's been known for since 1976, almost 40 years, that um, you could do a pregnancy test on a cow by taking a sample of milk and measuring progesterone. And in fact, several years ago, we were kind of curious whether this actually would change things. And we did it in men because they don't have baseline hormones to worry about. We just want to see what happened. Got a series of guys and had them have butter on pancakes, a cheese uh, serving for lunch and ice cream in the afternoon, and we could bounce the progesterone in almost everybody. That's just in 24 hours. So this is stuff that's absorbed and probably explains this observation. Now the next thing I'm gonna talk about is breast cancer in Marin, everybody's favorite topic in Marin. And pretty near 20 years ago, people began to look at the incidence of breast cancer in Marin and they made an observation when they followed people, followed the rates from about 1990 to around 2000, that breast cancer went up in Marin County. And the interesting part about it is that breast cancer in women under the age of 45 didn't change very much. And breast cancer in women over the age of 65 didn't change very much. But breast cancer in women between 45 and 65 years of age went up quite a bit. And if you look at that, that's that black line in the middle of the chart that takes off in the middle and starts going toward the top. And people looked at this and say, okay, what's going on in women in this age group? So the next question was, what kind of cancer is it? Now you can roughly divide cancers into two types. There's lobular and then there's ductal and all the other cancers. Lobular is its own little group. And then you can divide them into cancers that are hormone responsive or not hormone responsive, so-called ER positive or hormone receptor positive and hormone receptor negative. And if you look at the far left of this uh, picture, what you'll see is there are two bars. There's a uh, solid black line and there's a gray line that are right next to each other. The gray line is what you would expect for hormone responsive cancers in Marin County based on the way it is in the rest of the, of the United States. The black line is what it's in Marin County and that's part of where the difference is. The other place is the fifth line in where you again you have a black line that's a little higher than the gray line. This is the lobular cancers which are hormone receptor positive and again, it's significantly higher in Marin. So what you have is you have hormone receptor positive cancers are higher in Marin. So the first bit of information we know about breast cancer in Marin is by and large, it is the hormone receptor positive cancer. Hormone receptor negative cancer and small number of cancers do not seem to relate to hormone receptors. Those cancers haven't really changed in the last 10 years. It's all the hormone driven cancers that have changed. 
Now, the other thing it's important to look at is the right hand of the slide where the green line is the incidence of breast cancer by age in the state of California. It peaks somewhere in the late 70s, early 80s, and it drops off. I think the reason it drops off is because of competing causes of death, not because there's some miraculous thing you get old enough and you don't ever get breast cancer. The blue line is the San Francisco Bay Area, and the red line, which kind of runs up on its own, is Marin County. And you can see very clearly that the rate of breast cancer in Marin County runs above both California and the rest of the Bay Area most of the way. But the part that I want to draw your attention to is the part toward the left side where you're looking at women 45 years of age. The women 45 years of age also have more breast cancer in Marin County. And I'm going to come back to that in a second because the, the usual suspect, so to speak, for breast cancer in Marin County is hormone replacement therapy at menopause. And this is a paper from a couple of years ago where Airmen and colleagues, they went around to all the pharmacies in Marin and they estimated the, the number of women, the percentage of women who were actually getting prescriptions filled for hormone replacement. And the top line is, the pink line, is uh, estrogen alone. And the lower line, the blue line, is estrogen plus progesterone. And there are some very distinct things to notice here. First of all, I put the little arrow to mark where the Women's Health Initiative came in. And I would point out that there was a drop in hormone uh, use starting for both estrogen with and without progesterone, sort of beginning to taper down probably about five years before the Women's Health Initiative. So anytime you take something into account in this regard, you can't just say, oh, they stopped taking hormones and they all stopped because they stopped taking hormones a couple years earlier. The other thing to bear in mind is in the Women's Health Initiative, the blue line, the estrogen plus progesterone line, is clearly associated with a higher risk of getting breast cancer. The thing that nobody talks about is the pink line, estrogen by itself, in the Women's Health Initiative is associated with a slightly decreased risk of breast cancer. And that's a headache for anybody who wants to talk about this, but it is a fact. So that, that women taking the estrogen by itself, it's very hard to make an argument that that would account for hormone changes in Marin County. You could say the drop down is a the drop in the kind of hormones that would be associated with breast cancer. And the timing is pretty good. And that is that if you look at the types of breast cancer in Marin, the most important line on this, this is broken down. First of all, the um, little green line that runs across the bottom. Remember I said estrogen receptor positive cancers, excuse me, estrogen receptor negative cancers, the non-hormone related cancers, they're pretty constant. And you can see where they're pretty constant from the 90s right up through 2007 when this study was done. What you can also see is that the purple line, which is total in Marin County, sort of went up and gradually uh, had increased a little bit from the late 90s, hits a point about 2000 and then drops off, actually drops off a hair before the Women's Health Initiative in July 2002. And you can start to make the argument that it dropped off because we saw that drop off in hormone uh, use. And, that might be part of it, but there's one part of this that's a little hard to uh, look at or, or hard to explain, and that is to notice that the line goes down, and then at the end of the chart, the line is coming back up, and despite the fact that hormone use has stayed down. So it's a little hard to try to figure out how hormone use would go down, drive it down, and then the cancer would come back up while the hormone use was staying at a lower level. That's, that's a little bit of a trouble. So people have tried looking at trying to figure out what causes more breast cancer in Marin. They've looked at things like um, the, the, it's much more likely that somebody would be Ashkenazi's Jewish heritage in Marin. They've looked at women who do not have children. Uh, they look at alcohol consumption. Uh, the people in Marin County who get breast cancer are almost twice as likely to have two drinks of alcohol a day compared to the women who do not get breast cancer. So there's some clear associations. But there's this study that came along a couple years ago that kind of makes you stop and think about it. And that is, they went and looked at Marin County and they compared people in Marin County Kaiser to Kaiser in Eastern Contra Costa County, Walnut Creek, Danville, Pleasanton, because that's a demographic that's very much like Marin County. It's relatively affluent. Uh, the socioeconomic status, the use of hormone replacement therapy, body mass, and that sort of stuff in terms of looking at patients is quite comparable to Marin County. 
And they looked at some of the usual suspects to see what they would find. And they found, yes, Marin County has almost twice as many people in Kaiser who have Ashkenazi Jewish heritage. They have a significantly higher number of people who don't have a first child until after 30, and almost twice as many people who did not have a child at all. And the percentage of people who don't drink much alcohol is a lot lower in Marin County, about a third of people, as opposed to a little over 40% in East Contra Costa County. And so you look at this and say, okay, we've got all these factors and all of them. If they're the factors, then there should be more breast cancer in Marin than in East Contra Costa County. In fact, there isn't. It's a smidgen of a difference, but relative to the differences that we're talking about, it's not a significant difference. And these are fairly large numbers of patients. And what you sort of take away from that is you're kind of staggered for a minute, and then what you realize, or you start asking, what does Marin County have in common with Eastern Contra Costa County? It's been known for a long time that breast cancer is more uh, common in affluent women. It's more common in women who have uh, higher education, uh, hormone replacement therapy we've talked about, but you're left trying to decide what is in common between these two groups that would start to make them have very similar cancer rates. So what I would do is I would take you back to our graph where we looked at the pink line, which is breast cancer in Marin, the top blue line, which is breast cancer in California in general. And I would point to the fact that it comes down around 2000, 2005, and then it comes back up. And from that point, I would refer you to the national data level, da data statistics, because the national statistics are that breast cancer peaked in the nation. This is the SEER data from like 11 parts of the country where they, they track down every single cancer and what happens to them. There's a peak in breast cancer about somewhere about 1997, 1999. There's a drop, and on a nationwide level, there were papers written about, written about how women are not using hormone replacement therapy. We're going to see this big drop in breast cancer, and in the first couple of years, you saw a big drop. And then it came back up a little bit and has stayed there. It has not gone down like everybody thought it would, and you're left wondering what the heck is going on. So at this point, um, I would refer you to the little blue line across the bottom. Now that's breast cancer in men. And what you can say is there's not a lot of breast cancer in men. It's about one two hundredth of the rate in women. And so you're not going to see much uh, change in that line. But let's magnify that line a little bit and look at its shape. And this line, if this were on the same scale, the women's breast cancer would be somewhere up through the ceiling. And what you can see here is if you look from about 1970 to about 1985, there's one level, there's a little bouncing up. And then from 2005 to 2000, through 2008, breast cancer in men has settled down about 20% higher than it was in the 1980s. And you look at that and you're, you're sort of struck by something and that is the shape of the curve in men is exactly the same shape of the curve in women. And it's real hard to ignore the percentage change. It's hard to ignore the peak. It's hard to ignore the change in shape. And what you're left with is, whoa, maybe there's something in common. But you know what? You can't blame men for taking birth control pills. You can't blame men for taking hormone replacement therapy. They did not not have their babies until later. They did not not nurse their babies. There are a whole series of things that we hear about for women that don't apply to men. But you see the same rate. And this brings us to a really obvious question is, what's going on between, in, in, that affects both men and women pretty much on a national level? Because this is a sampling from the Los Angeles area, San Francisco area, Seattle, uh, there's sampling in Connecticut, uh, the Washington DC area, the Southwest, uh, the Midwest. I mean, this is a very comprehensive overview. So the place where I always go is to look at this paper from Mary Claire King. Mary Claire King is one of the people who was very much involved in figuring out what BRCA1 and 2 were. And she did this paper basically 10 years ago where she looked at women and she looked at women who all had the same genetic mutation for breast cancer. These women all had BRCA mutations. And she looked at the time in life that they got breast cancer in the women born before 1940 and after 1940. 
And this is a theme that I'm going to carry on with, and that is that the women who were born before 1940, they are the blue line, and they don't get breast cancer until they're a little later in life. The women who are born after 1940, they get breast cancer earlier in life. And what you're left with, and this, this is Mary Claire King based largely on studies with BRCA1 mutations. There's another study from MD Anderson published about a year ago, which found that in the same families that the younger generation on average got breast cancer about eight years earlier uh, than the older generation. So this has been confirmed. What in the world would make it and what would be different so that somebody born 10, 20 years later would get cancer earlier in life? So at this point, I'm going to talk about what I call the tale of three cities. And my wife looked at this and said, why do you give a damn about these three cities? And I'll tell you why. Because they're three of the most important studies in terms of thinking about uh, environmental chemicals and breast cancer. The first study is Copenhagen. Dieldrin is a chemical that is used as a... Um, Insecticide was used extensively in Europe, never really caught hold in the United States, fortunately. But uh, back in the 80s, they got some blood samples from women who had breast cancer, and they looked at their survival simply by divvying it up in terms of whether or not they were the first quartile, which is the lowest amount of dieldrin, up through the fourth quartile, which was the highest amount of dieldrin. And by everything else, you could predict survival just by the amount of dieldrin in the blood in the patient at the time she was diagnosed. This is an environmental contaminant that was there and simply seemed to set what was going to happen with the patient, city one. City two is Oakland, California. And this is a fortuitous study that was done with DDT. Now, some of you may be old enough to remember the DDT trucks that came around and sprayed DDT all over. I've got this great slide from the National Geographic that shows them spraying a beach uh, on Long Island with a big sign that says safe to humans and there's this giant cloud of DDT with kids running into it. Um, in the 1959-1960s, um, Kaiser was doing a study where they collected blood from mothers and blood from infants, not by sticking the infants, but by collecting the cord blood. And their idea was to look at factors that were involved in how these kids grew up over time. And this got stuck off in a freezer someplace and kind of forgotten. So around 2004, 2005, somebody stumbled across this and said, wait a minute, let's see what's in there. So what they did is they measured the amount of DDT. It's actually PPDDT, which is the metabolite, but that's basically what, if DDT is in you, you metabolize it to that, but that also works as an estrogen. And they looked at that in the blood and they looked at whether or not it had any effect on what happened with breast cancer risk in these women. Now, there's a very important distinction here, and this harks back to what I was talking about a few minutes ago. The women who grew up more recently get their cancer earlier. I remember I was talking about the BRCA1 mutations. A person who was age 14 in 1945, or uh, age 14 or younger in 1945, what that means is that uh, DDT was not available in the commercial uh, use in the United States. It was a war secret. And there was no civilian exposure to, DDT, exposure to DDT until the late 1945. So if somebody had actually grown up before that time, the 14 years or older in 1945, if you look on the right side, it didn't seem to make much difference. Their chance of getting breast cancer, if they were in the lowest, the middle, or the highest group, they're all about the same. On the other hand, if you looked at somebody who was less than 14 years of age in 1945, which basically meant that the girls matured um, and were exposed to DDT as their breasts were growing, as they were growing up, and then looked at their DDT level in their blood in 1959 to 65, and then looked at the chance of getting breast cancer over the next 30 years, what you find is that if you take the lowest as the basic risk, if a woman was in the group with the highest amount of DDT when she was in her 20s and she'd been exposed to DDT as she was growing up, she had five times the risk of getting breast cancer later in her life. And this comes back to a well-known principle that was actually first well elucidated in looking at cancer, uh, breast cancer, particularly in women after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the so-called Hibakushu, and what they found was that 
Women who were exposed to not atomic bomb radiation when they were 45, 50 years of age didn't seem to have much change in the risk of breast cancer. Girls that were teenagers when they were exposed to radiation had a lot of effect. So the timing of radiation is very, very important, and the timing of this particular insult is very important too. Now, talking about timing, uh, the third city is London. I'm going to give you a short history of diethylstilbestrol, DES. You probably have heard about DES babies. Uh, DES was synthesized in the 1940s as a potent estrogen to treat metastatic prostate cancer, nothing to do with breasts or women. In the 1940s and early 1950s, uh, somebody got the bright idea that maybe women got uh, uh, miscarriages because they didn't have enough estrogen, said, okay, we can fix that. We'll give them a really strong estrogen. Now, by the late 1960s, it was proven useless. It doesn't prevent miscarriages at all. And in the 1970s, gynecologists started discovering that the girls born from these uh, pregnancies where the mom had taken DES, they had a weird kind of cancer that just wasn't ever seen called a vaginal clear cell carcinoma. And this was identified as being seen basically only in women whose mom had taken uh, DES while they were pregnant. Uh, DES was taken out of the picture. It's still used occasionally uh, for treating prostate cancer, but it's got a lot of side effects. It also is actually uh, sometimes used as a last ditch drug for breast cancer because oddly enough, it actually seems to help treat it in some, it's kind of like you put everything in overdrive and sometimes that works, but we have better drugs now. 30 years later in the 1990s, people started looking at the moms to figure out whether or not the women who took uh, DES for a short time during a pregnancy, it would usually be five or six months during the pregnancy, they were found to have an increased risk of breast cancer. So if you, in a young woman in a reproductive period of life, put her breasts into hyperdrive with DES, you had more cancer later in life. But the part that's really disconcerting is that there has always been this nagging question is what would happen as these women grew up and who had been exposed in utero. Now you figure if somebody's exposed in utero in 1960, she's not going to be 40 till 2000, and breast cancer doesn't start to pick up till sort of age 35, 40, 45. And it was only last year, or a year and a half ago in the fall of 2011, that the uh, paper came out showing that the daughters of women who took DES during the pregnancy have almost double the risk of getting breast cancer by that time in their life. And these women are being followed uh, later on, but there's a short exposure that made a lifetime of difference for the person. So, okay, why would I care about all these things? DES was banned for use during pregnancy in 1971. DDT was banned in the United States in 1973. And Dieldrin was banned in 1985. Why do I care? It's very simple. This is a study that was done a couple years ago, and they looked at chemicals in fish. They went around and got roughly two tons of salmon from markets all over the world. And they looked at the content of a variety of contaminants in farm-raised salmon, the red bars, and in wild salmon, the green bars. And I would refer you to the third set down, uh, the fourth set down, excuse me, which dieldrin. And you can see that farm-raised salmon have a lot of dieldrin. Wild salmon has dieldrin in it too. And the reason for this is very simple. This stuff was sprayed on the land, you know, 20, 50 years ago. It's still washing out. It's going to be washing out well beyond my lifetime. You skip down a little bit, and somewhere down there, you also pick up, uh, uh, let's see, PCBs, toxophene, I think, oh yeah, total DDT. It's the second one. At the top, uh, you get total DDT, and you see the red line is a space over from the green line. The striking thing is the amount of DDT that's in the green line, which is the wild salmon. And the reason for that is very simple. The salmon lives in the ocean. This stuff washes into the ocean. Probably a big part of the reason why there's more of it in farm salmon is the farm salmon is closer to the shore. The stuff washes into it closer to the shore. It's more concentrated. It gets diluted into the ocean. As you get further out, and wild salmon only spend a portion of their life close to shore. The bottom line is that we have put this stuff in our own swimming pool, and we're going to be swimming with this for a long time. Now, the other question is, why in the world would you care about 
DES. DES is gone, except for a few specialized uses. But DES was the product of the Court Hall Institute in London, a guy named Edward Charles Dodd. And Edward Charles Dodd was looking at chemicals that worked like estrogens. And he actually started out with a chemical called bisphenol A, BPA, you may have heard of it. And the interesting thing is that BPA is a pretty darn good estrogen. What he then figured out is he did really kind of brilliant work for the time. Um, he looked at that and said, you know, if I tweak it and make a little bit of a change in the DES, assuming in the bisphenol A, I'll come up with DES and it may even be stronger. And he was right. But the striking thing is chemically actually how little difference there is between DES and BPA. They're very, very similar. There's basically one carbon uh, stuck in between the two rings. Now, all of this would be very academic, except about 15 years later in 1953, Hermann Schnell uh, at Bayer Chemicals, sort of, he says by accident, I don't know what was behind it, but the same guy, there was a guy at, at uh, General Electric and Bayer Chemical runs the lawsuit, so they get credit for it but they learned to make polycarbonate plastic. Now, polycarbonate plastic is number seven plastic. We're familiar with this from uh, Nalgene bottles until very recently when they changed the plastic. Nalgene is not a plastic, it's a brand name from a company. We're familiar with this uh, from the hard plastic bottles that are used in water coolers. Uh, we're familiar with this from sport bottles until fairly recently people became aware of that. And what happens is that the BPA is put into the plastic, and my, my eyeglasses are made with polycarbonate plastic. I don't eat my eyeglasses. It's a wonderful plastic. You can't actually get eyeglasses in the, state that are not made, in the states that are not made of polycarbonate anymore. But I don't eat it. I don't lick it. The problem is that it gets into food. Now, the story is kind of, has got a funny twist in it. This guy named David Fellman at Stanford was doing studies and he was looking at estrogens and he was trying to figure out whether there was something like estrogen in yeast. So what he did is he took yeast, put it into some sterile media and he grew it for a while and then he took the media out and looked and did some tests to see whether it acted like an estrogen. There's some very sophisticated tests. And he got all excited because he was finding yeast made something that was like an estrogen and this was really, really exciting. So what he did was he started saying, okay, how long does it take? So he went from a week down to a day, down to eight hours, uh, 18 hours, 12 hours, six hours, and there was still his estrogen. And finally he put it in there and didn't even bother to put the yeast in, and there was estrogen in it. And then he took a big step back from that and said, wait a minute, what in the heck is going on? And he realized that the stuff he was growing the yeast in was a polycarbonate plastic, which he was autoclaving stuff in it, and the yeast uh, had nothing to do with it the polycarbonate plastic was leaching bisphenol A into the liquid in the plastic. And this is really the, the origin of a lot of the concern we have um, about BPA getting into us from uh, plastic containers and food. And the, uh, the part on the right simply shows what happens. Uh, the, the darker gray bars are if you expose cancer cells to estrogen, and the lighter gray bars are if you expose cancer cells to BPA. The low line is without the estrogen, the higher lines are with estrogen, the low line is without BPA, and the high line is with BPA. And what you can see is that BPA makes cancer cells just grow just like estrogen. What we've been doing at CPMC Research Institute is we've been looking at breast cells before they become cancer. And just so you get an idea of it, this is a little ball of cells. Uh, there's a hollow in the middle. Uh, the red dots around are the nucleus of the cells and the little blue around the outside is the bottom of the cells. So you can see they line up in nice neat little circles and these cells grow like normal cells. And what we've done with these cells is we've looked at a whole bunch of genes. We've looked at how these genes respond to bisphenol A and somewhat the methylparaben because methylparaben is, is another chemical of interest. Uh, it's in um, shampoos, cosmetic products, and stuff like that. We have found that it has effect on the action of genes. It has effect on what we call pathways. And it influences what are sometimes called the necessary hallmarks of cancer. And I would point you particularly to the uh, part uh, a little above the, and to the left of the word cancer where it says sustained proliferation and then to the left of cancer where it says evade growth suppression.
in order for cancer to occur, the cells need to start growing and just keep growing, and you need to have them keep growing when a normal cell would die. Their, their mechanism in the body that makes uh, normal cells, or excuse me, abnormal cells should die, and cancer cells evade that. So to try to give you a little schematic of this, because my wife said that, that nobody would like all my pictures, I've, I've made this very simple. It's about how good cells go bad. You have to have cells that will grow, and they have to live when they should otherwise die. And all of these genes, it's not like one gene. The breast cancer gene doesn't just click in and you got breast cancer. It affects a whole bunch of other things. So the way the body works is so-called metabolic pathways. And there are a couple, of, there's, there's one big metabolic pathway that's involved in connecting estradiol to make cells grow. And it does this by triggering a, a, a series of processes. And the important point about this, as long as the estradiol is there, this process keeps going on. If you take away the estradiol, then what happens is the process stops and everything sits there, so nothing's growing. And what we've been interested in is what happens if you had add bisphenol A, BPA, or methylparaben. And what we have found is that they cause cells to grow, they cause them to live when they should die, um, but they don't bother with half the pathway. They kind of go in at their own place and kick it off. And what you're really getting here is that these uh, chemicals, we think of them as acting like estrogens, it may in fact be much more complex than that. And they may just happen, we think they're estrogen because it's a cell that normally respond to estrogen, but may have very little to do with estrogen. It turns out BPA changes the cell's response to normal estrogen, but may not actually be working as an estrogen itself. It's a very complicated, circuitous argument. To put a picture on this, the left-hand side here is fresh cells as we get them from a patient. This is done from volunteers. Uh, it's done when they're under anesthetic for some other procedure. We don't just rope people into the lab to do this, and it has a long consent form, so people know this is going on. Uh, fresh cells on the left side, uh, roughly the same size. If you put cells in the laboratory for 40 days without bisphenol A, some of them will survive, but they don't do real well. If you put them in the lab for 40 days with BPA, and this is the only difference, they grow like crazy. And what's really disconcerting is we've done this on over 100 different cell samples so far, but we've had one cell sample where the cells kept growing after you took away the BPA. Now, if I told you that every woman who got uh, radiation exposure got breast cancer, you'd say, what, that's not really true. In any one of these things, it's a risk factor. It's never 100%. It's always a proportion of people. But if we have a single person who's done this, we know that that can happen, and that, in fact, is what everybody's worried about. Now, one of the things that is a real problem in sorting this out is the gold standard for sorting out whether or not a chemical has an effect is to find a group of people that have it and a group of people who don't and then compare them and see what happens. But you basically can't do that kind of study because everybody in the United States is exposed to BPA almost every day. If you do random urine samples, 95% of Americans test positive. If you did it in Canada, which was done a couple of years ago, it's 90% across the board, 95% in the younger kids in the high 80s for the older people. BPA is found in mother's milk, in the blood of pregnant women, in the placenta, cord blood, and as I'll show you in just a second, it's found in children. This particular study is fairly recent one. It was like just a couple weeks ago, uh, which is why the slide's not real great quality. But it looks at a variety of levels of BPA. It looks in, in blood. This is blood concentrations. And the first column starting from the left is in children. The second column is all adults, and the third column is pregnant women. And you'd sit there and look at it and say, why would pregnant women have a lot of BPA? And then you go to the fourth column, and you look at pregnant women who had an IV before they had the blood drawn, and pregnant women who had not had an IV. And what you see is that the pregnant women who had an IV before the blood was drawn had a lot of BPA, and the pregnant women who didn't have an IV 
uh, before the blood was drawn didn't have much BPA at all. So what you realize is that the IV tubing is actually a potential source for bisphenol A, the tubing that's being used to give the stuff that's supposed to keep people healthy. So that kind of addresses the adults, but I would take you back to the left side and look at children. This is a sampling of children one to five years of age, uh, and they're not getting IVs. This is what they're exposed to in childhood. And as I showed you before, we're most vulnerable as children, and they're getting a dose of it. Now, where do you get that? Some of that comes from dietary sources. We've heard about this, beans, fruit, milk, soda pop. The place it's always, I get amuses out of it is that almost 100% of canned pasta, for some reason or other, people who do these studies love to look at canned raviolis. And they have a lot of BPA, and it's almost every one of them. But the place that's really interesting, look at these numbers and then look at the next slide, because this is a study looking at the amount of BPA, and they were specifically looking at the amount of BPA that a clerk in a supermarket was exposed to with thermal paper. That paper that's on your credit card receipt, that it spews out at the gas station, that's, that's when you go to Trader Joe's or you go to Safeway or you go to Nordstrom's. When they give you that receipt, that little slippery stuff on the side with the printing, that's BPA. And some of them say they're, they're, no, they're BPA free. That's right, because they have BPS. And nobody knows what BPS is doing, but it's almost exactly the same chemical. And this is all because nobody wants to bother with trying to have printer ink and manage printer ink to have printed receipts. But if you look in this uh, uh, figure, what you'll see is that the amount of BPA in the beverages and the fruits and the fish and the meal and cans is there. But when you look at what's in thermal paper, it's sort of off the charts. And the important part about this chart is that this is concentrations tenfold every time up. So it's one to the tenth. It's go, it basically, it doesn't read as 10, 20, 30. It reads as 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, and a million. So that the concentration of BPA in thermal paper the exposure is somewhere in excess of 100,000 times the exposure from soda pop cans. So what do we know about the actual effects of BPA? There's not a lot of data. I'm going to show you three representative studies, which are about as good as what's out there. Um, this is a study looking at urinary concentrations of BPA. And we pee BPA out really fast. If you give somebody a sample of BPA, uh, most of the BPA will be out in their, in their urine within about 24 hours. And if you divide people in those with the lowest concentrations and the highest concentrations, those with the lowest concentrations of BPA in their urine have the lowest uh, incidence of obesity. You say, well, what's the relationship? Obesity is very much influenced by the hormone function in the body. And we talk about breast cancer. Breast cancer is what I work with but there's evidence that BPA influences thyroid, it influences birth weight of babies, there's a whole lot of stuff that it, that it, that it has an effect on. Now, one of the things that, that some of the cynics have said is, oh my gosh, well, you know, it's poor people that have, because there's a very so strong social economic association with this, they're saying, you know, well, you know, all you're doing is saying that poor people have more obesity, more pe poor people have more BPA, and you're trying to be a snob because they can't afford to have organic food, I turn that around and say the reality is that just because somebody is poor, they shouldn't be exposed to something that somebody who's affluent can dodge. Everybody should be free of this kind of exposure. Um, this is a study of industrial exposure. They looked at urinary BPA, and this is the one the guys should pay attention to. Uh, it looks at male sexual function according to high and low levels of exposure to BPA as indicated by urine uh, concentrations. Uh, men had less interest in sex. They had erectile dysfunction, or ED, and they had uh, reported reduced sexual satisfaction. So this is actually an issue for men also. And finally, this study is literally April 16th of this year, um, a study done in Egypt where they kept collected simultaneous urine and saliva samples. Remember that these days you can do total DNA analysis on spit. And it was done, uh, in, the samples were collected in Egypt, uh, but the study was actually, all the analysis was done at the University of, Music University of Michigan, and the Centers for Disease Control did some of the BPA analysis because they are set up to do that. And they looked at urinary concentrations of uh, BPA. 
And they found that in Egypt, it was actually a lot lower than girls of the same age in the United States. This is looking at girls basically seven to 10 years of age. What they found was that higher BPA was associated with gene hypomethylation. Now, I don't expect you to have ever heard of gene hypomethylation, so I'm gonna give you a real short biology lesson. All of the genes in your body are capable of being turned on when you're born. When the, when the body starts, you know, you got that egg and that sperm get together, all of the genes are able to be turned on. Every gene has what's called a promoter section, and that promoter section makes the gene go on, and all of the genes are capable of doing that. As the baby develops and as we go through life, some of these promoter sections are just turned off, so the gene will never come on for the rest of life. Changing or adding a methyl group, it's a little chemical group, one carbon plus a few hydrogen atoms, adding a methyl group to these promoter sections turns them off. If you have hypomethylation, you are allowing genes to be turned on that should have been turned off a long time ago. Um, the gene, that one that I put there as an example, is you lose control of genes and there's the BEX2 gene which allows breast cancer cells to grow in culture. So what you are doing is the BEX2 gene shouldn't be working because this promoter section should have been inactivated because it was methylated. So you take away the methyl groups, you hypomethylate it, all of a sudden it can work, it can turn on the BEX gene and the cells can take off and grow. So this is the sort of thing uh, that we're very worried about. Um, similar work has been done by a guy named Lau at the, at the University of Texas, uh, but it was done in mice where he looked at the effect of uh, BPA also in changing gene methylation, because sometimes it goes up, you turn off things that should be on is what he was looking at. But this is turning, off th turning on things that should be turned off. It can work both ways. So there are real changes. You don't have to change the genes to get cancer. When people 10 years ago say, oh, we've figured out the human genome, we're gonna solve everything. There's been a big oops since then when people have realized that knowing that we have 30,000 genes is the opening page of a, of a very big book because it's the control of the genes that really determines what's going on. And what we're showing here is that BPA is monkeying with the control of the genes. So the last thing I wanna to toss in here, it has nothing to do with BPA. It's a study where they looked at birth weights and low birth weight is associated with a lot of lifetime problems. And if you look at the left side in each one of those, the little gray line is sort of people who had very low exposure looking at the mother's blood levels of the chemicals in Scotchgard, that's PFAS, uh, the chemical in Teflon, which is PFOA, or a common fire retardant. Uh, all of these are called uh, polyfluoral alkyl, com alkyl compounds or PFCs. And what you can see is the kids where the mom had the higher levels they actually had low birth weight. You're monkeying with mother nature at a very, very vulnerable time in life. So the takeaway, get exercise, ought to try to get a minimum of three and a half hours a week, limit weight to the body mass index between 20 and 25 if possible, limit alcohol to about three and a half drinks a week, avoid food with the chemicals that you know about, but more importantly, recognize that research to try to sort this all out is horribly underfunded. Um, the large foundation that gives us pink ribbons uh, does not really support any prevention. I think they have a bit of a conflict of interest if you look at the large water bottle company that has pink ribbons on the side of the truck. Um, the large makeup company uh, which could get involved in this, I think has a conflict of interest because their products contain parabens. Um, the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute, some or other just don't seem to be on board. Um, the real leader in funding this, other than money that we raise from small groups here and there, is the California Breast Cancer Research Program. And um, Mel and her group have done a really, really good job of trying to find ways to fund research and they actually have been the people behind a lot of what we've done. And um, so I think that in California, you can be happy that 
that what is being done by your state to try to actually address something. But it's kind of like air pollution. California's ahead in air pollution too. We're sort of leading the charge and it's very, very important. Final slide I would leave you is whether or not bees are the canary in the mine. You remember the analogy that the miners would take a canary down there and when the canary died they knew there was too much natural gas because you can't smell natural glass, gas unless it's been scented. When the canary died you get the hell out of the mine. Bees in our society are in a great deal of trouble. We all depend on bees. I love almonds and I didn't know until very recently every almond has to be, has to be fertilized and have pollen transferred by a bee. So we're very dependent on this. Bees are at risk and it's probably not one chemical. It's probably the effect of multiple chemicals that weaken them across the board. And I think we have to start looking at whether or not they are in fact the canary in the mine that tells us that we're allowing ourselves to be living in too much. And my final thought is the environment as a cause of cancer and other health problems is the defining issue of our time. As we make decisions about the environment, what we have to remember is that what we do or do not do will still be the defining issue in our grandchildren's time. Thank you very much.